So the first keynote speaker today is our cyber colonel from the Netherlands. I said, how do you want to be introduced? He says, I don't care. So here is Hans and give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you all to be here, for being here. And I appreciate that you are here after such a hard night. And I, you all survived Amsterdam, and I hope you liked it. Um, this is new to me, uh, because I started my career uh, back in 86 as an artillery officer. Uh, and the artillery is these big guns, and uh, I used to command a battery of the biggest guns, 203 millimeters, 90 kilos grenades. So be careful if you use these against mine, me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm commanding the Defense Cyber Command. Uh, you might have heard of it. It's the newest uh, unit in the Dutch Armed Forces. And what I would like to do today is first tell you a little bit about security in a defense organization and how that evolved through the years, uh, starting uh, in the, with the Roman Empire and, and uh, right now. And just to give you a flavor of how security is part of our DNA and how the things you are doing actually fit in that quite well. And it's a new approach. I just thought about it when I uh, prepared this presentation, but I think it's, uh, it's nice to, uh, to hear. And then I, I switch to what we are currently do and give you some conceptual insight of what cyber operations mean and what it means in the light of a military operation. Um, if you have any questions, please just step forward to one of the mics and ask. I do not need to get to the end of my slides. I just want to uh, provide you with the information you would like to have. So don't hesitate. Just interrupt me and we'll see where we get. I have until 9.45 and then we'll finish. So easy. Um, yeah, that's me in uniform. Now I'm in civilian, but uh, sometimes I use, I have uniform as well, and that's the logo of my unit. Back in the, uh, the Roman days, security was provided to single houses. Single houses had a fence around, and single houses were scattered all over the area. And the security was just this little wooden fence. There was one entrance, one connection to the outer world. And you can see that compared that to a single computer connected via a simple line to the outside world, maybe with a modem. Uh, I saw some retro things back out, out there. Uh, so some of you still know what a modem is. Um, and we, there is some security on the modem saying, hey, you cannot get in, but maybe not. You see here it's just open, but it's just one connection. Uh, so one single computer, not real security. And if you know your way, you can get in quite easily. And then we went to the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, there were these fortifications. Small cities, large walls around it, high walls. Uh, again, just one connection to the outer world, but also some water around it. And you could lift the bridge over the water so nobody could get in. And you know all about the stories uh, about enemies who tried to get in and get stuck and stayed a long time uh, around that city, uh, just trying nothing to get in and out. 
Um, sometimes enemies tried to uh, dig a, a tunnel to get here or use a boat, but there were some additional measures over there. You can compare it to a simple little uh, network of computers, these houses, a, maybe secured with a firewall, one connection to the outer world, some antivirus, and that's it. And then, First World War. First World War, we had these, these lines, the Magnot line, here, it's over here, and in Germany, the Siegfried line. Uh, trenches all over, uh, locks to try to, uh, to prevent the enemy from coming, coming in, but it was just one line of defense. One line of defense, and if you get, could get through that line, you would be in the area behind, and that was all open. Compare it to a larger network with many connections to the outer world, where you have firewalls, where you have antivirus, but only on the outside. And if an intruder gets into the network, uh, everything is open. So you can do basically whatever you want as soon as you're in. And if you get help from an insider, then it's more easy because you're already in. And these, these fortifications, or the, these, these lines, they were just secured from one side. So if you're in, you can get things out quite easily. So and then the next step, the Cold World War, the, Cold, the Second World War and the Cold War. In that period, we had defense in depth. And defense in depth meant that we had a front line, we had some light units at the front line, and we had heavier units behind, and we had units in the rear. And you can see it here. There was a forward combat zone, a rear combat zone, and a rear land, the so-called communication zone. And there were also clear um, agreements between the army corps, corps about the line in between. There was some, there were, they created compartments and they created a kind of authentication. If you would use current uh, terminology. And basically, this is one large network. We secure the outside and with firewalls, with antivirus, we have maybe have some honeypots around and we have some IDSs to secure the, the inside. Yeah, sure. What I do on a day to day basis in my job. All right. Do you mind if I take that question for a little bit later? Yeah? But I come back to that. And if I don't, don't remember me. Um, so, the, and, and you can detect anomalies there. You can do some more, something more in, in the military side, and of course, in computer networks nowadays as well. And then it comes to the new threat. Where are we now, and where are we going? Well, actually, this is a picture when I was deployed in Afghanistan in 2007. And in 2007, we had this counterinsurgency war. 
ongoing there. And basically, all the allies were scattered around whole of Afghanistan. We had presence all over in the, with the ISAF, the International Security Force. And Netherlands was, uh, was over here in Uruzgan, and at that time we had the lead as Netherlands over the whole southern region. And I was military advisor to the commander of the southern region. But what you see is although you're everywhere, the enemy, and basically this is Afghanistan, and all the red dots are attacks from the Taliban on uh, this area, this is the area with permanent Taliban presence and the red dots are attacks resulting in deaths in that period. So here in the southern area it was quite heavy. Um, but what you see here is the enemy is already in. The insurgents are already there. You can protect whatever you want. You cannot protect the whole area because the enemy is already amongst you. It is the war amongst the people. And today we talk even about hybrid warfare. And hybrid warfare means that all instruments of power, diplomacy, information, military, and economics are being used to influence a, an enemy. And that, that to, and basically an enemy tries to influence us on all that, all those um, uh, elements of power. But is already amongst us. It's already being done. Yeah, you see it in, uh, you have seen it in the Ukraine, you, have, uh, you see it right now in the Baltic States. So you see it in, in the Middle East and that's exactly what's happening in, the f will happen or is already happening in computer networks. They are already infiltrated by criminals. They wait until there is an option to get information out or to get, uh, to get money out. So we have to find a way to defend ourselves better against enemies who, and in, in computer terminology, intruders, who are already in our system because we cannot defend the system on the outside anymore. And that is just something I do not have a solution to yet. I think nobody has, really has, but it will be the, our challenge for the future. And maybe something for you to think about. So let's go to my daily work. Let's go to what the defense organization, the MOD in the Netherlands, is doing in the cyber domain. Actually, there are four roles we have to execute. Four specific roles we have. And the first role is protection. We have to protect our own networks, our own systems, our weapon systems, our sensor systems. It is about, um, as, it, as for any other company, ensure that nobody gets in and that we protect our data, our information. And that is not only our usual day-to-day uh, -day network, but as those are also our secured networks, our isolated networks, our networks within the weapon systems, networks within our sensor systems, it's everything. And we have, as it is described in the Dutch cybersecurity strategy, 
where every where it's clearly described everyone is responsible for his own security. It's in the defense organization, in the MOD, it's exactly the same. But at, in addition to that, we have created a CERT, DEF CERT, Computer Emergency Response Team, to have a look at what are the threats coming up and how do we react and provide advice to the owners of the networks on how to protect themselves, what measures to take, and to analyze if there are any intrusions. And of course we got attacked. Of course we have uh, incidents, as everybody else. The second role is the intelligence role. We have a military intelligence and secret service, defense intelligence secret service, DISS, and they operate on basis of the law on the intelligence services. And they make use of the digital environment to collect information in order to protect the Netherlands. That this is very strict regulated. Very. All right, I'm sorry. Uh, I need to stay here a little bit because the camera doesn't see me otherwise. Are these lines for that? Okay, great. <laughs> so they didn't tell me before. Okay. Um, so there are very strict regulations and it is controlled by our parliament. And then the th third role is the law enforcement role. We have a military police who looks after criminal soldiers and after criminals who do something to the MOD. And of, they do all, as well the border protection. And you can imagine that that has, with identity fraud and so on, that has some cyber component as well. These are roles which are performed on a daily basis uh, because there is a law for it. It's self-protection, it's the law on the intelligence services, and it's the police law. And it is basically a task compared to civilian tasks. Everybody protects itself. We have also a general intelligence service uh, for the state security, and we have the police. In addition to that, we have, of course, military operations. We are military. And it's our task to protect the homeland. It's our task to contribute to world security. And it's our task to support, if requested, one of the other civil, maybe military or civilian, um, civilian organizations. And you have a question. Can you put on the microphone? Because I think not everybody can hear you. A bounty program? Yeah, sure. <laughs> no, no, we don't. No. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we have a responsible disclosure program. We do, we, do not, we have, do not have a task in checking other companies or other organizations. We as a defense organization have a task in protecting ourselves and everything which is related to the 
defense organization. Um, of course, there is a, in our first main task, protecting the Netherlands, uh, the Netherlands soil and the soil of our uh, allies. You can imagine that there is a role in protecting also in cyberspace, in the digital environment. However, the, and I will come to that in a later stage, the armed forces will only operate after a decision of the government. And a decision of the government to use armed forces is only taken after an armed attack on the Netherlands. And an armed attack in digital space is defined as an attack to the Netherlands with comparable damage as a conventional attack, which means death and means physical, severe physical damage. And even then, even after that, it is up to the government to decide how to react. So it's not that the armed forces is the, are the firefighters, are the digital firefighters for the, uh, for the, for the Netherlands. We are armed forces and we work on the basis of the, um, of the, 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 uh, the law, Article 97 and Article 100. Article 97 says there, is, there are armed forces, and Article 100 says we operate um, as, uh, after the, on, on a decision of the government, and we will report that to the parliament. There's a question back there. Well, we, we, we comply to the, to the uh, responsible disclosure program as uh, the, the rest of the Dutch uh, authorities do. So you can see that on the... Yeah, as I said, you can read it on the, uh, on the website of the National Cyber Security Center. Um, and and that, is, that is what we use. It is for the whole, uh, whole government. Um, and of course, if, if some people come to us and say, hey, we found something, uh, we will see on a case-to-case -case basis what we do. That's fair, very clear. But I, we, as, as an armed forces organization, we need that to keep that below the level of uh, real communication. So as an armed, armed forces, we have also a task to support military operations. And that is what we do with the Defense Cyber Command, supporting military operations. And actually, what does that mean? That means that uh, cyber is an integral part of all future operations. We cannot neglect it. That we do have digital systems and that an enemy has digital systems. And as we fight against conventional systems with maybe conventional um, arms, we, conventional weapons, we do that, we should do that to digital systems as well. And those are not the conventional networks, not the internet. Those are weapon systems, those are sensor systems, those are military systems and military targets. And one additional role is 
here that of course there is a need for coordination and uh, facilitation of all cyber activities within the armed forces and that is something I do as well so cyber operations what does that mean the employment of cyber capabilities in the, with the primary purpose to achieve only five minutes left okay half all right with the primary purpose of achieving objectives in or by the use of cyberspace and this is the concept let me let me explain um, the coherence of military power is based on the coherence of a physical component the weapon systems we have a conceptual component how do we operate and a moral component the will of our soldiers and if you break that coherence there is no military power anymore and how do you break that coherence well if you attack objects physical objects the weapon systems or you attack persons the soldiers or you attack the psyche of those soldiers because then you get into the will and how do you attack the psyche for example via information operations provide them information which is not maybe not true this is conventional this has been done for ages already and of course this influences each other as well and at the end there is an effect and there's disruption of the three components of military power new is that you do have cyber identities and cyber objects and if you attack those then you will have an effect on the other physical objects and a disruption on the components of military power as well. well what are cyber identities and cyber objects well it's described here the physical dimension a person with a psyche with his psyche and a an object for example to keep it simple a phone and it's not only the object the phone but the sim card is another object those are physical things and if you break them then they won't work but a phone and I do not have to tell you I think but a phone has is as well a cyber object it has an up uh, it has a uh, operating system it has a MAC address it has an IMEI number uh, the sim card has an uh, the sim card has has an operating system it, it has apps on it do you know what apps are oh no okay all right so and all these things are cyber objects and if you disturb them if you make that make sure that they do not work if people who use them cannot trust the cyber object then you disrupt in a military operation the military power and the other thing are cyber identities your email account your Twitter account your t telephone number and so on the way you identify yourself in cyberspace and if you disrupt those then you achieve as well an effect in military power so that's basically what we would like to do in a military operation to military targets and it doesn't mean that you only need a piece of malware or a live hacking you need more you need cyber capabilities which is a a coherent uh, set of humans humans with brains with creativity people who really know what they're talking about who can who really know what the enemy would like to do 
and really know what we want to like to achieve, what the effect is what you want to achieve in the military operation. Of course, you need technology, the technology to create cyber capability, to test it. You need a cyber lab, a cyber range, an environment where you can test you need a lot of intelligence because the large difference between criminals and military in a military operation is that criminals attack a million computers at once. And they don't care. While military need to be very precise, you're only allowed to attack that one target. And you're only allowed to do so if it's a military target. So you need to know where is it, what is the system, what operating system has it, what version, what patch, and so on. Question over there. A lot of what you're asking is a task of the intelligence service. And they operate, and I'm not going to tell you what they do, but they operate on basis of the law of intelligence services in the Netherlands. We have very strict laws on that. And they might be more strict than in other countries. For example, we are not allowed to um, just get data from the internet and absorb everything we can find. Um, so, yeah, we have systems in place and we look what is happening, but within the strict rules of our law. So intelligence is important and the, the question is, is clear. The question is, what can you collect in, in uh, intelligence? Well, we can collect depending on the situation. And if it's in a military operation, we have specific rules. And if it's in not during a military operation, prior to a military operation, we have other rules. Furthermore, you need to process in place very strict process in the development of your capability, testing, planning, decision making, and at the end, uh, reporting. Uh, document, documenting as well. Because at the end, in, in the Netherlands, if the military used armed forces, used does an arm to attack themselves, there is a prosecutor who looks whether that was reasonable and whether that was okay to do it that way and whether you did all to uh, prevent collateral damage. Damage to people who were not involved in the conflict. But there's one thing we know. Cyber is part of future conflicts. And cyber, yeah, we will only know when things are stopped to work. But fighting in the fifth domain, next to air, 
land, space and sea will be part of any conflict now and in the future. And that brings me to the end of this presentation. Are there any questions? I can't imagine. Maybe too many questions. Oh, well, I'm happy to take any questions, even many questions. Yeah. And uh, a lot of your weapons, uh, I assume, are also now connected uh, and interoperating via via a network. How do you? Uh, who is responsible then to bring to align this, the security aspect and, and the safety aspect? Is this uh, your department, or is this? No, it's not my department. It's the we have a. Um, a security safety authority in the Netherlands who is responsible exactly for these things you, uh, you mentioned. So they uh, set the caters for how we implement security and safety in the armed forces. And others, every commander is responsible to implement those rules. Yeah, yes, that can happen. Well, the question was, uh, in conventional warfare, not everybody uh, creates his own bullets, but you just, just buy them and you have the same on, on either side. Is that the same in war fighting in a digital domain, whether uh, develop yourself and does the, the opponent has maybe the same systems and is it then a weapon race, basically, who has the best systems. Yes, it is. It's, it's very clear. At, at the end, it's about security. It's about, and that, has, that is a, a primary role. It's our task to secure our own systems and to secure the Netherlands. Any more? Yeah. Uh, critical infrastructure of an enemy would immediately be a military target. So, for example, is it not in your capabilities also to attack uh, critical infrastructure, energy uh, providers, and, and that kind of thing? Well, it is uh, in the human terror, the, the law of warfare. Uh, it's clearly described what are military targets and what, what not. Uh, basically, civilian infrastructure is not a military target. In some cases, it can become a military target, but that is very rare, specific rules. And, and you see a development there as well that, that you do not want to attack those. Uh, I'm not going to talk about what we are training for. <laughs> no. What do you think about encryption? Encryption. Yeah, very good. <laughs> yeah, important to secure yourself. It is important to have good encryption and to use good encryption. And doesn't it in any way hinder your work? No, not my work because I'm not looking after information. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it. May I ask, may I ask one main question? Yeah, you can. You said your enemies and your allies. 
as we know from NSA, Snowden stuff, is it a clear war between enemy and allies these days? No. Um, we trust our allies and we see that something is happening in the digital environment uh, which is um, some kind of getting used to it. It's a new environment and we need to get used to what we're doing and sometimes we do things we maybe shouldn't have done. Uh, the other thing is that everybody immediately believes everything which is, has, Snowden has said, but there's very little proof to many of those things. So, um, I, I think we are all at the beginning of a development, uh, and the development, the technical development, and your work as well, 